It's because you can't get pregnant. That's what my husband said, blaming me for his affair and asking for a divorce. I was furious. He thought everything would be settled with the divorce, but he was mistaken. The real drama starts now. My name is Susan. I'm 43 and divorced a few months ago. My ex-husband David is 48, and we didn't have any children. Sadly, the reason was on my end, but the original cause was partly David's fault, too. We married when I was 33, already close to the age, for high-risk pregnancy. I wanted to start trying for a baby as soon as possible. I went to the gynecologist to make sure there were no issues with my health. Unfortunately, David got a big project at work, making it impossible to try for a baby. He was assigned to set up a new branch office in another state and had to stay there during the week, only returning home on weekends. David asked me, I'll try to come home on weekends, but if we have a kid, you'll be mostly on your own. Are you okay with that? Not feeling confident in managing alone, I hesitated to answer. We couldn't count on help from our families either, as they lived far away. Believing David's words that he might return in a year, I gave up on trying for a baby for the time being. But his assignment ended up lasting three years. When he finally returned, we eagerly started trying to conceive but with no success. A re-examination at the hospital revealed that my ovarian function had declined, likely due to aging. Though there were options like hormone therapy, the chances of pregnancy were slim. I was devastated but knew it wasn't David's fault. He apologized repeatedly. I suggested that we keep trying naturally and enjoy life, just the two of us, and he agreed. However, David's attitude began to change over time. Seeing families out together, he would say enviously, that must be nice, the perfect family picture. His words also grew harsher. There are several single mothers at my work who manage despite everything. They get support from the government. You should have just gone for it, he would say, indirectly criticizing my reluctance. Certainly, such women are increasing, and I respect them very much, but I didn't have the confidence to do it myself. Was it my fault? After about five years of tension, David suddenly asked, What do you think about adoption? Adoption? That's out of the blue, I replied. Well, I know a girl who got pregnant before marriage. Why don't we adopt her baby? He suggested. Stunned by his bizarre proposal, I was silent until he explained, I just really want a child. When I heard that girl got pregnant, it immediately came to mind. Adoption, huh? I hadn't considered that, I thought, but something about what he said nagged at me. A girl, an acquaintance? I'd understand if it was a relative, but what does he mean by a young girl acquaintance? Trying to sound casual, I asked, Oh, so she's young. He replied, She's just 24, a beautiful girl, so the baby inside her is sure to be healthy and attractive too. Could she be someone from his office? But would a woman in her early 20s discuss such a personal matter with a male boss over 45? Or could she be his mistress? That's when I first suspected he might be cheating. Observing him, I noticed several suspicious behaviors. He was constantly glued to his cell phone, coming home late, wearing underwear I hadn't bought, and faint traces of sweet perfume. But what really convinced me was him skipping our anniversary. We didn't have a wedding ceremony due to our jobs, but registered our marriage on December 24th, Christmas Eve, and always celebrated it as our anniversary and Christmas. Yet this year, he chose a work party over our tradition. I believed his words that he would come home early and waited alone with a Christmas tree decorated, a cake and Christmas dinner prepared, and a gift for him. It was heartbreaking to wait alone with no response to my numerous calls. He finally contacted me the next morning. His voice sounded too cheerful as he said, Ah, sorry, I accidentally overslept at a friend's place. I replied, Okay, I get it. I threw away the cake, Christmas dinner, and your present. He casually responded, Oh, what a waste. No need to sulk, just because I missed our anniversary. I'll make it up to you. I retorted, No, it's fine. You might as well not come back home. 
Why not live with the person you were with last night? He seemed to be still intoxicated or lost in the memories of last night, saying, Hey, don't say that. Besides, her apartment is small. Unknowingly, he dug his own grave. I'm going home early tonight, Susan. Forgive me, the old man apologized in a brusque tone, which made me want to vomit. That evening, my husband came home with a face as if nothing had happened and again began talking about the adoption. Let's start the process soon. She wants to decide quickly. I asked, why are you so eager to adopt a stranger's child? What about her partner or parents? Can I talk to her or her parents first? He became flustered and stammered. That's because, all right, the guy ran away, and apparently she has no parents. I decided to test him. I'm sorry, but I'm not interested in raising a child born from a reckless woman and a foolish man, I said. He blurted out in anger, what? You're insulting me and Sarah. There he fell right into my trap. Realizing his affair was exposed, he finally understood. You could have just asked for a divorce instead of making me raise your and this Sarah girl's child. That's called cunning. Apparently, Sarah, unable to raise a child, but still wanting to give birth, had convinced him of this plan. He said, it's your fault for not being able to have kids. You should be grateful I'm letting you raise my child. That was it. I snapped and said clearly, then let's go to court and see who's right. He lost his temper too. Fine, I don't want to see your face again. Divorce, get out. Hearing that, I placed the divorce papers I had received earlier in front of him. Caught off guard, he signed them, unable to back down. I didn't want to spend another second with him. I gathered my essentials, filed the papers, and went back to my parents' house. A week later, he called me. Your stuff is still here. Pack it up and get out. Take everything. I informed him I'd come with my lawyer over the weekend. Shocked by the mention of a lawyer, he reluctantly agreed. When I threatened to go to his office unless we settled on alimony and property division, we eventually agreed on a settlement of $150,000 in total. But the next day, on my way back from a part-time job, a young woman approached me. It was the infamous Sarah. She was David's type, short, with long hair and cute, but her heavy makeup made her look tacky. I can't pay it all at once. She yelled in a shrill voice as soon as she opened her mouth. It's none of your business. David agreed to pay in front of the lawyer, I replied. He actually hesitated, but he didn't want to deal with me any longer and eventually gave in. Why did you call me here? She demanded. That's something you should ask David, I said, unimpressed. Rest, she mumbled. I thought we could just ditch the alimony sneakily. So she planned to make partial payments and then disappear by moving or changing jobs. Well, sorry for you, but you can live in that house, right? I remarked. That's David's house, isn't it? What about the mortgage? She asked. It's in David's name, and the mortgage is fully paid off, I informed her. Well, I guess that's okay then, she said, backing off with a tone that suggested she was up to something. I think she is up to something, but whatever it was, it wasn't my concern anymore. Two years later, David contacted me. Please lend me some money, he begged. What? I asked in disbelief. Those two are spending like crazy, he exclaimed. Apparently, Sarah's mother had conveniently moved up to the city and was staying in that house. According to Sarah, David wanted a child, so I gave birth, but I never said I'd raise it. Once she realized she could have pawned the child off on me, she said, raising a child is hard, so I'm calling mom, and brought her mother from the countryside. David initially welcomed her, thinking she'd help with the child care, but it turned out neither she nor Sarah was doing much parenting and instead spent their time frolicking. Well, knowing her mom, that figures, I said, unimpressed. Then David, who still seemed to like Sarah, suddenly yelled at me, don't insult Sarah. He suddenly yelled at me. She agreed to marry an old man like me and even had my child. It's all your fault for not being able to have kids, he accused, bringing up the past. Okay, I can't argue with that, but can I say something? I asked. 
What now? He grumbled. Remember when I went for a fertility check three years ago? You were tested too, remember? I reminded him. Yeah, I guess, he recalled. I went to hear the results alone. Actually, they said you had issues too. I revealed the truth and he gasped in shock. The gynecologist had mentioned that for his age, David's sperm quality was quite poor, making pregnancy unlikely even if I had no issues. I had learned of my problems first, so I assumed I was the main cause and didn't want to hurt him by revealing his results. That can't be. Sarah got pregnant, he argued in denial. Whether it's your child or not, I don't know, I said, silencing him. His reaction suggested he might have had doubts himself. I rubbed salt in his wound. Even if a DNA test proves it's not your child, it might not change anything. What do you mean? He asked, confused. The child is over a year old, right? I pointed out. So what? He pressed. Current law doesn't recognize paternity disavowal suits filed after a year since birth, I explained. If discovered after a year, a different lawsuit is needed, often leading to disputes. Even if a DNA test proves no biological relation, there's a chance of losing the case. Why? The test clearly shows it's not my biological child, he protested. Well, there's a Supreme Court ruling. Even after divorce, the man had to pay child support, I explained thoroughly. Hearing this, Taka just muttered, it can't be. It's not true, in a trembling voice. Sorry for your troubles, I replied. According to neighbors, those two, or rather three, are constantly battling every day. It's unclear if the child is David's or not. We're getting divorced. Get out. Sell this house and pay child support. I'm never leaving. You get out. Such arguments are heard daily, and they're reportedly quite intense. They've had the police called on them multiple times, and both women have even been detained. As for me, I'm currently living with my parents. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm enjoying my single life, keeping busy with work and hobbies.